If you take your Bibles and turn with me now to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 15. I'll take that. Thank you, guys. As we continue on in our exploration of this book and the uh, wonderful works of God in, in the early years of the church. Today we come to Acts 16. If you can believe it, we're already in Acts 16. Some of you are like, wow, only in Acts 16. <laughs> Acts 16, verses 6 through 15 today. Ever since I uh, had a daughter named Lydia, I've always been excited to preach about the story of Lydia, so here's my chance. Acts 16, beginning in verse 6, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he, or we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. He has said these things to us that his joy might be in us and that our joy might be full. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I think of that hymn that we just sang moments ago. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise. Hear him, ye deaf. Oh Lord, I pray at this time, Lord, that we would indeed hear your voice. That we would indeed praise you for your wondrous works to the children of man. For how you have sought us, how you have rescued us and redeemed us, Lord, from the mire. Lord, even in this passage, we see your great, great love for your people put on great display. Even when it comes to just one family. Oh, Lord, we pray that you'd love on us now. Feed us with your word. Amen. In the summer of 2018, actually, uh, just around the time I arrived here at UPC, there was a search and rescue story that was dominating the headlines. The whole planet was actually caught up in this thing. Some of you might remember 12 members of a junior association football team along with their coach, were exploring a cave system in northern Thailand. And while inside, heavy rainfall flooded the cave system and trapping the entire team inside. Efforts to locate and rescue the group were, were stymied by continued rain and flooding. Rescue teams were called upon, including uh, professional divers. This became an international story. 
Eventually, the group was found alive two and a half miles from the mouth of the cave. The problem is now they have to get them out. So rescuers discussed all kinds of ways to extract the group from the cave. They labored 24-7. Water was being pumped out of the cave 24-7. And in the end, thanks to as many as 10,000 people working together, including more than 100 divers, and the pumping of more than 1 billion liters of water, the entire group, all 12 boys and their coach, were uh, rescued. It's gone down in history as maybe the most heroic and the most successful search and rescue operation in modern history. It was even made into a movie a couple of years ago by Ron Howard. Well, friends, the story of the Bible from beginning to end is, in essence, a giant cosmic search and rescue story. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that creation is subject to futility. It's cursed. It groans together in the pains of childbirth, Paul says, longing to be rescued from its bondage. You've felt this. You're part of creation, aren't you? You've groaned as a mother or father or husband or wife, whatever you might be, as someone who's known loss or betrayal, who's had to bear some kind of pain, whether it's humiliation or guilt or regret, you have groaned, you have experienced that numbness, that loneliness, that desire for shalom, as we heard last week, for all things to be returned to what they should be. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that the groaning of creation, the groaning of your soul and body has been answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus was sent into the world to do the difficult, terrifying, lonely, and ultimately lethal work, a work that no one else could do, of diving into the water and rescuing us from our deep and abiding groaning. I've said this quote before, but it's, it's worth repeating. C.S. Lewis compares the work of Jesus to that of a deep sea diver. Someone who goes beneath the water, rushing down through green and warm water into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay. Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping precious thing that he went down to recover. That's the gospel, according to C.S. Lewis. Friends, we see a microcosm of this in our passage today. Here in Acts 16, right at the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey, Jesus, and especially the spirit of Jesus, engage in a monumental search and rescue plan for lost souls. Except it's not an entire city or a region that he rescues this time. It's not the multitudes, it's one family. One family. See, that's the amazing thing about the Spirit of Jesus. He's not just interested in rescuing the crowds, followers, multitudes as a whole. He's not like a, you know, a stockholder, well, I better have my high numbers. I, get, I better get that big return on my investment. No, he's the kind of Savior who knows and loves each one of us by name and will go to the greatest of lengths to seek out each one of us. He's a shepherd who will stop at nothing to find that lost sheep. That's what we're going to be thinking about today. Today we're going to spend some time thinking about how the Spirit of Christ, especially in regards to baptism, overcomes every obstacle 
He overwhelms every blockade. He bridges every gap to prove his promise that he is our God and our children's God forever. That's our main theme. And we're going to split it into three parts. Number one, the Spirit pursues us. Number two, the Spirit cleanses us. And three, the Spirit welcomes us in our children. First of all, the Spirit pursues us. So, as I mentioned earlier, Paul is now on his second missionary journey, but he's not alone. Paul has Silas. He also has young Timothy. And one more. Anyone guess who it is? Our author. Verse 10 is the first verse in which Luke actually uses the first person plural, we, to describe Paul's missionary entourage. So everything that happens moving forward in Acts, Luke seems to have actually witnessed firsthand. So our missionary heroes are journeying together as we see in verse 5. They're preaching the gospel. They're discipling new believers. They're strengthening the churches. And the church is growing. New disciples are being added to the church daily, Luke says. And notice this is all a work of the Spirit. It's not because of Paul or Silas or anyone else that this revival of sorts is taking place. No, the Spirit is very much building the church here. Look at verses 6 through 10. Who's the main character here? Who's the one leading the story along? It's the Spirit. Directing, coordinating, leading the apostles where to go and where not to go. Go here, but don't go there. Sort of like when you're driving south to El Paso. You know, you're on the 10... And you see cones starting to veer into your lane. You know, the, those cones have been there for, I don't know how many years at this point. So what do you do? You know, you start to drift this way. And then a mile down the road, you see those cement barriers, and they start to guide you this way. Well, that's sort of how things are going here. The Spirit says, yes, go to Phrygia and Galatia but not to Asia, not yet. Yes to Troas, but no to Bithynia. God closes some doors, and he opens up other doors. The point is, all along here, God is the one leading the charge in the execution of his great commission. He is the great missionary of Acts the one taking Paul's group by the hand to find the lost sheep, eventually taking them all the way to Macedonia. Look at verses 9 and 10. Paul sees a man standing before him in a vision. This man says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul knew that this too, this vision came from God. God himself had given Paul a call to get up and go, to go and preach the gospel in Macedonia. So Paul gets up, he heeds his master's call, and he goes. You see, the Spirit is very much a gatekeeper all along here. He's, he's uh, the construction worker who puts those cones in the road, closing some doors while opening up others, all to accomplish his purposes for his church. We don't like closed doors. Closed doors frustrate us, usually because we don't understand why doors close, or why certain doors close while others open. Providence eludes us. Even in this passage, we really don't understand why God forbade the apostles from traveling west to Asia or north to Bithynia. Maybe it was too dangerous. Maybe the soil there was just too hard for the gospel to take root. We don't know. But this is sort of the, you know, the whirlwind of providence. This is part of being creatures 
not the Creator. Sometimes doors close, and we don't understand it. James Boyce is really helpful on this point. He says that closed doors are indeed negative guidance from God, but it's still true guidance. And he's right. Sometimes God puts cones in the road. Sometimes he shuts down the road altogether. All throughout our lives, God gives us these detours of providence, not because he's playing games with us, but because he's saving us for something better, something sweeter, something we never would have known or experienced if we had simply stayed where we were. And again, in the moment, we hardly ever understand it, do we? My wife and I did not understand why we miscarried three months ago. I asked her permission to say this. We still don't understand. That was a closed door that was slammed in our faces, and it frustrated us. All our hopes were just sucker punched. But somehow I know, I trust, that God has something better for us. Here's the thing, when it comes to determining God's providence, discerning God's will, as they say, the fact is we can't know the mind of God. You and I cannot pry into the mysteries of the divine. However, especially you, you young people who are thinking about the future, should I go to this college or that college? Should I marry this woman or call it off? As you navigate those questions, do two things. First, seek the Lord, seek His Word. Then, just look at the doors. Seek counsel, read the moment, and assess what doors are opening and what doors are closing. What kind of advice are people giving you, people you trust? Where's God leading in His, in His providence? The Spirit pursues us. He seeks us out, closing some doors while opening others. That's the first thing we see in this divine search and rescue plan. Second, the Spirit cleanses us. So Paul heeds his master's call. He goes to Macedonia, which is where we will stay the rest of our chapter. Macedonia had a very rich culture in its heyday, especially under the Greeks. Philosophy architecture, poetry, history, science. It, 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 it's been called a pillar of modern civilization. Um, nevertheless, despite all of its plush perks, it needed the gospel. And so Paul goes to meet this need. He sails across the sea to Philippi, which was a leading city in Macedonia, and after staying there some days, Paul and his missionary companions on the Sabbath head outside the city gate to the river to pray. It occurred to me, by the way, this week, maybe that's where they got the song from, Down to the River to Pray. I don't know. Down to the river to pray they go. And while there, alongside the river, they share the gospel with some women that they meet, one of whom was a woman named Lydia. Now, in the original Greek, we're actually not given her name. Luke says that she's from the district of Lydia, but we're not actually given her real name. She's from the district of Lydia, the city of Thyatira, Luke says. Uh, Thyatira was, was a city in the ancient world known for its fine clothing and, and the manufacturing of a purple dye that they were able to extract from a, a particular kind of shellfish. Not sure why I told you that. Um, it's useful. File that away. Uh, anyways, this woman, this seller of purple goods, she hears the gospel, and she opens her heart to hear and believe it. In verse 15, she's baptized. Now let's talk about baptism. Let's talk about baptism. I don't have to tell you that baptism is a very controversial topic. I think... Um, 
Not a single aspect of this doctrine is agreed on among Christians. What is baptism? Why do we baptize? Where is baptism done? When is baptism done? And probably the most controversial these days, who is to be baptized and how is it to be, to perform, how is it to be performed? All of these questions are under heated dispute among God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. Even in this room, we're not going to all agree on this. But as a Presbyterian church, it's, it's on the sign outside, not hiding the ball. A church that holds to Presbyterian beliefs. I'm going to teach this morning what Presbyterians believe. Now, if that's not what you believe, if you're not a Presbyterian Today, that's okay. We're glad you're here. I still hope that this is helpful to you. Now, as we wade into this, pun intended, the first question we have to ask is this. Who's the agent in baptism? Who's the main actor on the stage? In other words, is baptism something we're doing for God or is it something that He is doing for us? Well, biblically speaking... It's very much the latter. God is the agent. God is the one declaring something to us in baptism, not the other way around. Simply put, baptism is a token of God's amazing love for us in Jesus. It's a pledge of His undying commitment, promising us, assuring us, comforting us throughout our lives that just as we are cleansed by water, we are cleansed from the guilt and the power of sin. That even our deepest, darkest sins have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb by grace alone, through faith alone. That's baptism. The Apostle Peter is helpful on this point. In 1 Peter 3, Peter talks about a lot of things. Among them, the subject of baptism. And he mentions baptism there in relationship to something that we might find kind of odd and irrelevant to baptism, Noah's flood. Namely that the latter, the flood, is a representation or a picture of the former. According to Peter, the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament established by Christ himself in the Great Commission when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The true meaning and the significance of that sacrament is found in the flood story. Baptism is a picture, it's a representation, a copy of the flood. And it's easy to see why, right? They both represent new creation. The old passing away and the new coming about. And in both, this happens through water cleansing. Remember in the flood story, God unleashed chaos upon his creation. He sliced open the fountains of the deep and the waters of heaven to submerge the earth with water. And why? Why did this happen? So that he might recreate it anew. Well, the same with the waters of baptism. Baptism signifies the end of the old, the beginning of the new, the washing away, the cleansing of sins, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the transition from death to life, darkness to light. Jesus Christ instituted this sacrament to depict this reality in visible form as something to assure us that just as water washes away the dirt of the body, so also the blood of Christ washes away the guilt of my sin. It assures us, it assures me personally, that Christ's sacrifice on the cross is mine. His blood washes away my sin, that the old has passed away, the new has come for Jordan for Richard, for David. You see, this is how sacraments work. As we heard earlier, 
in the scripture reading from Genesis 15. The sacraments at root are God's answer to Abraham's burning question, how can I know? You know, God comes to Abraham and he makes all of these promises and Abraham says, well, do you really mean it? How can I know? You ever find yourself asking that? I do, all the time. All the time. I was talking to my kids about this just last week. So many times we hear the word, we learn about the wonderful works of God, but we're skeptical. How can I know that's true? How do I know that God will really make good on his promises? Is he really trustworthy? Well, that's why we have sacraments. Sacraments are God's pledge. They're God's oath to the doubting heart. They're God's physical, visible answer, his, his, his take it to the bank guarantee to those who find themselves living by sight, not by faith, that his promises are true, that he can be trusted, that those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. It's yes and amen, verily, verily, verily true. Now the question is, does baptism itself accomplish this? In other words, does the washing of water itself Bring about the cleansing, the new creation. Now, there are some who would say, yes, of course, the waters of baptism do the job. In the doing, it is done. It's like that scene in O Brother, Where Art Thou? When they're having that mass baptism in the bayou. Lines of people are just walking down into the water. Then uh, Del Mar, one of the main characters, this fugitive from the law, upon seeing what's going on, he... he elbows his way to the front of the line. He gets dunked into the water, and then he reemerges saying, well, that's it, boys. I done been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. Some would say, yeah, that's what baptism does. Remember, when it comes to sacraments, there's always a sign, then what the sign points to, what it signifies. In baptism, there's the sign. There's water, the stuff inside that bowl. Then what the sign signifies, what the sign points to, the washing away of sins. The sign does nothing. It's just tap water. Can't save anybody. The sign can never give us the thing signified. No, only the Spirit can do that through faith alone. Friends, it's the Spirit alone who puts the old creation to death and brings about the new, who resurrects us from death to life. Believe that, and you will be saved. And how do we know that? Because baptism tells us so. Lydia believes in Jesus. She's brought under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and she's baptized. But not just Lydia noticed. Uh, Lydia's not the only one to get baptized here. No, she's baptized along with her whole household. Why? Why? Well, this leads to the last part of the divine search and rescue plan. The Spirit pursues us. The Spirit cleanses us, and finally, the Spirit welcomes us and our children. Now, this is the first recorded instance in the New Testament of what we call a household baptism. There's actually four in the Bible, five if you count the story of Cornelius. In fact, there's actually another household baptism in next week's passage with the uh, Philippian jailer. Now, to be fair, do any of these passages describing household baptisms specifically state that infants were among those in the household? No. But I'm going to argue here that they don't have to. Why? Well, when Luke talks about 
household baptisms, he's tapping into something very specific, something very old. He's tapping into specific covenantal language, language that goes all the way back to our scripture reading. He's tapping into that ancient promise of God, a promise echoed since Abraham, and I'd say even since Noah, the promise that God is not just our God as adults, but He's also the God of our children. That God is the God not just of isolated individuals, but of households, Christian parents along with their children. Now again, I know we're not going to all agree on this, but it's still important for me to give you what I believe the Scriptures teach on this as a Presbyterian. Briefly, I'm not going to bring up every argument. I'm not going to answer every objection. I know we are all hungry for lunch. But in short, in order to really understand why we baptize babies, we need to understand God's relationship to households going all the way back to the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 12, after the disaster of the fall, God established a covenant with Abraham, promising to make him into a great nation, a blessing to all the families of the earth. And yet notice that Abraham was not the only one to receive this promise. No, God promised the same thing to his children as well. God promised to be Abraham's God and his children's God. And attached to that covenantal promise, we see a sacrament, circumcision. God commanded Abraham and his children to be circumcised. Now, hit the pause button. Who were Abraham's children at this point? Remember, his children were Isaac and Ishmael. Now, Isaac, we get. We get why he's circumcised. Isaac was the faithful one. He was the heir to all the promises of the covenant. But Ishmael, God didn't promise that stuff to Ishmael. Yet even so, God commands that both receive the sign. Even knowing the two opposite paths that these children were to walk, they both get the sign. And why? Because, again, God embraces households. Yes, some will stay true and will follow the Lord. That's what we pray for. Others might not. But they all, all those in the covenant, receive the promise and the sign of that promise. The promise that let every man be a liar, but God is faithful. Now here's the thing. That promise in early Genesis has never been revoked. In fact, it's only been renewed to Christian parents and all of the Isaac and Ishmaels of the church today, God continues to make this promise. This is why Jesus never pushed children away despite the disciples' best efforts. Remember, he said, let the little children come to me. Why did he say that? Because he liked little kids? He probably did. But there's a deeper reason, because of Abraham. This is why in Acts 2, after preaching the gospel to the Jewish crowds, Peter says this promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Now to any Jew, in earshot of that, what would that have reminded them of immediately? Abraham. This would have immediately clicked in their minds that the promises given to believers and their children under Abraham have not been revoked. They have been renewed. The church is a place that welcomes believers and their children. And if that is true, connect the dots, if children along with their Christian parents are still embraced together in the Abrahamic now new covenant of the church, then they should receive the sign of that covenant. Which, we don't have time to get into the arguments for this, it's in Colossians 2, is no, is no longer circumcision, but baptism. You see, this is why Paul baptizes Lydia and her household good friends. Whether or not there were infants present. Whether Lydia's children believed 
themselves or not. What Paul is doing here echoes something that we find throughout Scripture. It echoes that age-old promise that goes all the way back to Abraham, that household promise, the promise that to you and to your children, I will be your God. Now, does this guarantee that all of our children won't walk away? Does this mean that all of Lydia's children are now in heaven? No. The church is always going to have Ishmael's in her midst. But that doesn't nullify the promise. The promise that he will be faithful even when we are faithless. I'll close with this. You see, congregation, the lengths that our Savior goes in his search and rescue. He goes all the way, no half measures. He spares no expense. He pulls out all the stops in not just seeking us out, cleansing us of our sin, but even declaring his promises to future generations. He's so tenacious. He's so relentless. He's so unstoppable in declaring his loving kindness to his people. Congregation, I know we're all groaning. This side of Eden. We're all groaning. Along with all creation. For rescue. For God to step in. And make all things new. The wrong doors keep closing. The wrong doors keep opening. Premature goodbyes. Unrequited love. Lost opportunities. Regrets. Remorse. Loneliness. Losing a child. Losing a pastor. Me saying goodbye to a congregation that I love. We groan over this. When will it end? When will we get to shalom? As C.S. Lewis put it, when will everything sad come untrue? When will everything sad come untrue? Well, there is such a day, friends. There is a day coming when all the doors will close on the desert of this evil age and all the doors will open on the green pastures of the age to come. In fact, you know what? That promise is all there embedded in the promise of baptism. One day the old will give way to the new, not just for me or for you, but for all creation. One day all the cosmos will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One day all things will be washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, and we will see Him shining brighter than the sun. And there will be no more darkness on that day. There will be no more night, no more groaning, no more goodbyes. The search and rescue will be complete and we will be home. So let's press on together. Not because we're strong enough, not because we're smart enough, not because we're tenacious enough, none of us are, but because He is. Because He is unstoppable. Because He is, what is He called in Revelation? Faithful and true. Even to the end. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you go to such great lengths, God, to declare your loving kindness to us, and yet we still find ways to doubt it. We still find ways, oh, Lord, to think that we know better, to think that you're somehow hiding the ball, to see that that, that we, we, we assume, oh, Lord, like Adam and Eve did, that you're not giving us all that there is. Oh Lord, we pray that we would trust you. 
We pray, Lord, that we would trust that promise that you have spoken, that you have declared, that you've even put in a visible form in baptism to all of us, all Christians throughout the world and throughout time, to believers and their children, that you will be our God and our children's God forever. Lord, help us to trust in that promise. O oh Lord, rescue us. Rescue your people. Gather us in, O oh Lord, from the four winds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond to the preaching of the word, let's stand together and sing one more song.